This upcoming Saturday, this upcoming Shabbos is the ninth day of Av, which is called Tisha B'Av. And it is the saddest day of the Jewish calendar. Now, there's lots of laws that are pertaining to this day, but because the day falls out on Shabbos on Saturday, therefore we mark it, we celebrate it on Sunday, on the 10th day of Av. Over the millennia, scores of unfortunate events happened to our nation on the ninth day of Av, on Tisha B'Av, on this inauspicious day. King Solomon, of course, built a temple after his father, King David, died. This temple symbolized the very strong connection that existed between our nation and God. It was the spiritual epicenter of the Jewish people. It was the political epicenter of the Davidic monarchy. And on the ninth day of Av, 400 and some odd years after the first temple was built, it was destroyed by the Babylonians. Again, that is the first major upheaval that happened to our nation after living in the land of Israel for 852 years. 70 years later, the temple is rebuilt on the temple grounds. And that temple in Jerusalem will stand for some 420 years. And it too will see its end on the ninth day of Av, on the same worst day of the Jewish calendar, this time not by the Babylonians. They are long extinct. It's the Romans who destroyed the second temple. And over the course of history, tragic and unfortunate and terrible events kept on befalling our nation on this day. For example... About 65 years after the temple is destroyed, there's a Jewish resistance called the Bar Kokhba Revolt, and that resistance is stamped out, and the Jewish, the last Jewish stronghold in the land of Israel is in the city of Beitar, and that city is conquered, and the liquidation of the Jews of that city begins on the ninth day of Av. The Talmud points out that that devastation, that destruction, that slaughter that ensued from the destruction of Betar actually rivaled and even exceeded the destruction of the temple 65 years prior. Over the course of history, there's a long list of bad things, terrible things, tragic things that have happened to our nation, various expulsions from different places all over the world, other tragedies, other calamities that happened on this day year over year. And for thousands of years, thousands of years now, the day of Tisha B'Av has been marked as a day of fasting. And not just any fast. There's many fasts in the Jewish calendar. There's six actually to be precise. But this is the most severe of the fast days. Not only do we fast, do we refrain from eating and drinking. It is one of the only two fasts that are a 25-hour fast. It's like a Shabbos. You have to add a little bit beforehand and a little bit afterwards. And it's not just the day from the morning to the night. It's from the previous evening to the following evening. Moreover, it's a day that there's fasting mixed with mourning. We mourn over the terrible things that have happened to our nation. We sit on the floor. You're still not supposed to sleep with as many pillows as you usually do. You don't wear nice clothing. You don't wear makeup. And there's other prohibitions besides for eating and drinking. Namely, you're not allowed to wash, not allowed to shower, not allowed to smear yourself with oil, which was quite common to do back in antiquity. You're not supposed to wear leather shoes, refrain from marital relations. You're not supposed to do any business on this day. It's really the worst day of the Jewish calendar. And I was thinking that now that we're on the precipice of this really sad day, I think I want to explore why is this day so bad? Why is this day so designated, so reserved for bad things? What is the significance of the temples for us living in 2018? You know, where thousands, almost 2,000 years ago, there was a building in Jerusalem. Why should that matter so much to me today, uh, to us today? And I also want to kind of shed light on the essence of what this day symbolizes, because I'll tell you, for me personally, this day was always very difficult, because it's not inspiring. It's, you're supposed to feel sad, but you don't, you don't really feel sad. 
So you're supposed to try to kind of create an artificial sadness, which is a little bit awkward. So I, I personally struggle with this day. And I think it's worthwhile to kind of go to the root of the day, understand exactly what we're doing, exactly what we're commemorating, exactly what we're mourning. And if we do that, I think the day will have more meaning, not because we'll have easier access to make ourselves sad. I, I think that's an unnatural way to go about it, but really to kind of think about, to, to dwell upon what exactly this day represents. And I think a good way to plumb the subject is to look at the Torah at two specific events, two specific existential sins that the Jewish people committed. There's two times in the Torah where the Jewish nation or parts of the Jewish nation commit a grievous sin that God says to Moshe, that's it, I'm done, I'm fed up, I'm through with these people, I'm going to destroy them and we'll start from square one. Let's cut our losses and start anew. Twice. And at both times, the Almighty Almighty tells it to Moshe, I'm going to kill them, destroy them all, that's it, I'm done, we'll start again. And Moshe intervenes, and Moshe requests that they be spared, and the Almighty accedes to Moshe's request. One of those two episodes, number one, the sin of the golden calf, a month and ten days after the Sinai experience, Moshe's in heaven. We know the story. The Jewish people concoct a golden calf. They seem to be worshiping it. Moshe comes down, crashes the tablets. God says, I'm going to destroy them. Moshe prays, and the nation gets saved. That's the first episode. And the second episode happens a little more than a year later, the sin of the spies. They're about to go in the land of Israel. They've been out of Egypt for a year and a half, a little less than a year and a half, and it's time to go into Israel. However, before you attack a country, you send scouts to go spy out the land. So that seems like the prudent thing to do. They take 12 of the leaders of the nation. They're going to be the spies. And we know the story as well. They spend 40 days scouting the land. They see a lot of crazy things, steer them a lot. They come back and they share a bad report. The nation is too strong, they're so big, they're so mighty, that the, the fruits are so abnormal, everyone's giants there, there's no way we could possibly conquer, we should try to find a different option, go back to Egypt. And we know the whole nation starts crying, and God says again, I'm fed up, I'm going to destroy them all, Moshe starts praying, and the nation is spared, but they have to all die in, in the desert, and therefore there's 40 years of, in the, of the Jewish people in the wilderness before they go into the land of Israel. 40 days of the spies' mission equals 40 years of traveling around, wandering in the desert. That's what we're told in the book of Numbers. And I think if you read these stories, it sounds a little bizarre. It sounds like almost childish. God says, I'm going to destroy them. Moshe says, no. And God says, oh, oh, okay, I give in. Like, it's... Of course, maybe there is one element of like, oh, this is the power of prayer. Moshe is able to change God's mind. It's not like God said, I'm going to kill him, but I'm not really going to kill them. This is just a threat. God doesn't make empty threats. The Almighty tells Moshe, I'm going to kill him. He means, that's it. We're done. We're going to kill him. And Moshe, through his prayer, is able to change that. So there is one way to look at it with respect to Moshe, the power of Moshe's prayer, the power of prayer in general. But I think that there is... There's a deeper point here, and I want to examine the teaching of the Sepharno on these two events, these two sins and their aftermath, and I think really shine a light onto what the relationship between the Jewish nation and God is, what it was, what it could have been. So the Sepharno says that even though God said, I'm going to kill them. Moshe says, don't. And they were spared. Even though they were spared, something actually did change. Something permanent changed. Why? And he points out there's a critical verse right after the episode of the Ten Commandments at Sinai. And this is in chapter 20 of Exodus. Right after the Ten Commandments, God tells Moshe, okay, build me an altar, bring sacrifices, and it ends. Bechol makom asher astir eshmi, avo elecha ubrachticha. Wherever 
you announce my name, I will come and I will bless you. The Sephardim points out, what does this verse say? Wherever we call out to God, he will bless us. Says the Sephardim, we don't need a temple. We don't need vessels. We don't need any intermediaries, anything to aid our connection to God, wherever you may be. You're in Tokyo, you're in Mexico City, you're on the moon, it doesn't matter. Wherever a Jew is, they call to God, right away God listens and God blesses him. That is the state of the nation right after Sinai. Immediately, a few verses afterwards, that's what it says. And what happens 40 days later? There's a sin of golden calf. Well, what's the sin of the golden calf? The sin of the golden calf is the Jewish people say, you know what? Let's create some sort of alternative. It sounds a lot like idolatry. They are distancing themselves from God. They're taking a step back. They're saying, well, we need an intermediary. We know this closeness is a little too close. And God, of course, says, I'm going to destroy them. And Moshe says, no, don't destroy them. But the truth is, from that point forward, even the Jewish nation survived. They survived that encounter. They weren't totally wiped out. But you know what they lost? They lost the opportunity to have the closest to God, wherein wherever they are in the world, they could connect to God. God will be close to them. From that point forward, from the point where the Jewish people committed the sin of the golden calf, it mandated that they had to have a temple, a mishkan, a tabernacle. The scope of where God is going to be super duper duper close to a Jew, it narrowed. It used to be the whole world, wherever you are. And now, Jewish people take a step back from God. God says, I'm going to take a step back away from you. Now it's going to be limited to a temple. I want to read to you what happens a few chapters later in the book of Exodus. We read, this is chapter 25. God tells Moshe, this is after the sin of the golden calf. God tells Moshe, okay, it's time to fundraise. We're going to build a Mishkan. And he tells him all the things he needs to get for the Mishkan, to fundraise. And afterwards, well, what's the plan? Verse 8, They should make for me a Mikdash, a base of Mikdash, a temple, a tabernacle, and I will dwell amongst them. Wow, sounds amazing. God's saying he's going to dwell amongst us. And that is just an incredible statement. The Almighty comes from the spiritual world. Really should have no place here in the, in the physical world. That we, we could be close to him. God could dwell amongst us. Wow, what an amazing achievement of closeness. But the truth is, it's not, it's actually a downgrade. Previously, it was Bechol Makam Asher Ashmi Previously, is wherever you are, you you mention the name of God. You have a temple in Tokyo. You have a temple in Mexico City. You have a temple wherever you want. Wherever you invoke God, that's where you create a kind of the conditions of the temple. Now, it's going to be limited, and the Sephora points this out over here as well. Before. The sin of the golden calf, it was everywhere, and now it has been narrowed. This is the point I want to convey here. Our nation determines the relationship that we have with God, not vice versa. It's not that God says, oh, how close will I be to the Jewish people? He doesn't make that decision. We make that decision. Therefore, with the sin of the golden calf, we take a step back. We took a step back away from God. He responds in kind by taking a step back away from us. Thus, the threat that God says, Moshe, I'm going to destroy the Jewish people. Moshe says, no, 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 don't do it. God says, oh, okay. It seems like God had a plan, and Moshe changed the plan, and God's plan fell away. The answer is no, no, no. God's plan still stood because he did destroy a little bit of that close relationship that he had with us previously. Now we moved a notch down. What happened with the sin of the spies? Sin of the spies, same story. God seeks to destroy the, destroy the nation. Moshe intervenes. God relents, tells them the nation will die out. 
What does the Midrash say? The Midrash says that the Jewish people, when they heard the libelous report of the spies, they spent the whole night crying. But really, they were crying for naught. It was baseless sadness. It was baseless mourning. Because after all, if you have God on your side, you've got the magic bullet. You don't need to worry about the fact that there's some giants in the land of Canaan who are intimidating you. You don't have to worry that the cities are well fortified. You don't have to worry about any of that. In essence, with the sin of the spies, that amounts to the Jewish people taking a second step away from God by saying, hmm, can we really conquer this land? I don't know. Look at our army. It looks pretty pathetic. And that, of course, is a tacit rejection, repudiation of God. Because if you recognize God's omnipotence, no amount of any human power, superpower, or nuclear power doesn't matter. They have the H-bomb. Who cares? We have God. By the people being worried, by the people crying, you want to cry? You're going to have a reason to cry. Why are you going to have a reason to cry in the future? Specifically because of your decision. You took a step back away from me with the sin of the, of the spies. You're stepping back. You're withdrawing, pushing God away from us. Well, God will do the same. God will take a step back away from you. Well, what happens when our nation is further more distant from God? We don't have God's protection anymore the same way we had it previously. We're vulnerable. We're exposed to all kinds of, all manners of, of terrible things befalling us. And therefore, a direct consequence of this needless crying of the night of the sin of the spies, that automatically, because that exhibits a distance between us and God, it's going to manifest itself as well in real tears that are the result of God distancing himself from us. So, in essence, what we see here in these two stories are successive degradations in the relationship and the closeness between the Jewish nation and God. With the sin of the golden calf, we lost what would effectively be a ubiquitous temple. We would have had the conditions of the closeness of the temple wherever, and now we only have it in one place. Says the Talmud, what is the result of the sin of the spies? What day was the sin of the spies where the needless crying happened? That was on the ninth day of Av. Therefore, on this day, we distance ourselves from God. This is the same day where God's going to take away the temple from us. Even a limited temple, even a Mishnah, a tabernacle, a place, one oasis where we can have closeness to God, even that will be taken away from us because of our stepping away from God. So in essence, what this is telling us is that the temple is more than just a building, of course. And it's more, more than just a, a, a place to do spiritual activities. It is a representation, a manifestation of the Jewish nation's closeness that we can potentially, and we used to have in the past, that we can have between us and God. And there is, of course, many, many sources to this. Uh, for example, the Mishnah in Perk Avos, chapter 5, Mishnah 5, lists 10 ever-present miracles that happen all the time in the temple. And these are all miracles that are supernatural. How do we have supernatural miracles? The answer is that with respect to the temple grounds itself, when the, when God is amongst us, that's a supernatural existence. It's it's like the Jewish people before before we got to the land of Israel, we're, we're eating manna. How do you eat manna? Well, if God's amongst you, you eat manna. That's a miracle in our world, but not in the spiritual world. And therefore, if you could create a little embassy of the spiritual world here, well, then miracles are bound to happen. So Talmud lists 10 miracles. No woman ever miscarried in the temple. No meat ever spoiled in the temple. No fly ever came where they're carving up the meat, and it never happened. You think about how much meat went through that facility every day, and there was never any spy, there were never any flies to come and attack the meat. 
the Kohen Gadol was never disqualified on the eve of Yom Kippur. If it would rain, the rain would not extinguish the wood on top of the altar. The wind never disrupted the fire, the smoke that was going up. There was never problems found in certain offerings. People would stand together. Everyone was very close packed together. But when, when it was time to pray, a time to bow down before God, time to atone, suddenly, miraculously, there's plenty of room and no one is right next to their neighbor. And finally, when the temple was extant, there was never a snake or a scorpion that injured someone in the city of Jerusalem, and there was never a lack of room. There's always room for someone, for another guest. There was, you think about it, the whole Jewish nation would make pilgrimage to the land of, to Jerusalem multiple times a year. How does the city accommodate it? It was a miracle. Which means that what the temple created or recreated is miraculous existences and therefore miracles that were ever present. That is a manifestation of the Jewish people's closeness to God. And when we are marking the tragedy of the ninth of Av, it's not about a building. It's about lamenting the lack of closeness between us and our Father in heavens that resulted, that actually caused, that effectuated the destruction of the temple. And of course, what is the most miraculous of all things that happened in the temple? Easy access to atonement. When someone sins, that is going to cause spiritual blemish to their soul. You come to the temple, bring a sacrifice, you repent, boom, it's like it never happened. That, again, is reflective of a Jewish nation that is close to God. When we talk about Tisha B'Av, it's about ruminating the fact that we no longer have that closeness. Moreover, it's about steaming ways to try to restore that. Again, if the whole reason why we have the lack of closeness is because we ourselves caused it by taking a step back away from God and therefore he took a step back away from us, well, how do you fix that? We take a step closer to God. He, in kind, will respond by taking a step to us. The Talmud says that every generation that the temple was not rebuilt it's as if the temple was destroyed. So the past generation, we haven't had a temple built. It's as if we had a temple and we lost it. What that means is that the temple is not some sort of building that you could build it or you cannot build it. It is a reality that would invariably result if our nation takes a step closer to God. God will always mirror the relationship that we have with him. That's what he'll have with us. If we take a step closer to God, He will take a step closer to us. And that, of course, how does that manifest? It manifests itself with the temple. In fact, the Talmud has a whole series of teachings, several places in the Talmud, about, well, what do we do now? We don't have a temple. And therefore, ergo, we're distant from God. Well, okay, how do you penetrate that darkness? The Talmud says, for example, in the book of Brachos 32b, from the day the temple was destroyed, a metal barrier separates the Jewish nation and God. Well, wait a minute. If the temple is destroyed, what does it mean that there's a new barrier between us and God? Again, that's the point. The point is the temple itself is a manifestation of a close relationship that we have with our Father in heaven. If we don't have a temple, that obviously shows that we don't have a close relationship. So if we don't have a close relationship, what does that mean? How is that manifested? It's like as if there is a metal barrier separating us. The Talmud goes on to say, From the day the temple was destroyed, The gates of prayer are locked. There's a gate through which we could influence, so to speak, God's decision-making called prayer. And you know what? That is a manifestation of the Jewish people being close to God. Temples destroyed. What does that mean? It means we're distanced from God. Barriers separating us. That door, that gateway 
is under lock and key. Well, so how can we connect to God? Says the Talmud. But there's one gate that was never locked. And that is the gate of tears. There's one gate of prayer, and that one's locked. But there's another gate called the gate of tears. That's never locked. That's the one. That's how far we need to go. We have to become so emotionally and spiritually connected to God that it results in tears. Then we can have some sort of a way to influence God's will. Similarly, the Talmud says in the book of Brachos, again, page 8a, from the day the temple was destroyed, God has no place in this world with the exception of the four cubits of Torah study. If someone studies Torah, they are creating a mini transportable temple wherein God is close to mankind, to the Torah study or like it was in the temple. And in fact, there's a bunch of teachings in, in, the, in the Mishnah and Perkei Avos. One person studies, two people study, three people study, four people study, ten people study. People are studying Torah. God is amongst them. And I was thinking, like, we could really take this idea of what the temple really represents and what the relationship between the Jewish people and our Father in heaven, we could take that and really extend it to all of, all of Jewish history. A lot of people talk about, you know, how could God have allowed the Holocaust to happen? Mm-hmm. And now I think that maybe we should not be asking such questions. Maybe we shouldn't be speculating on such matters. My grandfather was always very quick to say, if someone did not suffer in that horrific genocide, they should not opine about it. So I don't want to talk about that specifically, but that question is a common question. And really, this is the answer. I'm not saying it because I don't want to talk about it, but this is the answer. The answer is that invariably bad things will happen. And they've happened throughout our history. And you wonder, you read about Jewish history, and you, how is it possible that one nation will be constantly smitten again and again, but not die? And this all stems back to Moshe's prayer. Moshe's telling God, okay, don't destroy them. Just be distant from them. Well, what does that mean? What does it mean that the nation that God is distant from, but not willing to destroy them? It means a nation that's going to suffer a lot, going to be exposed to all kinds of terrible things, but God is not going to sever that relationship. He will repulse us. He'll reject us. He'll push us away. He'll be distant from us, but he'll never get rid of us, so to speak. And that is, I would say, the the one silver lining, really. Talmud says something so unusual, so counterintuitive. It says that there's a prayer that we say every day called the Tachanun prayer. The Tachanun prayer is the prayer of mourning, where you fall on your face and you cry to God. Well, there's one day a year that you don't say it. And that's Tisha B'av. And obviously the question is so obvious. Wait a minute. This is the day that you're supposed to observe the laws of mourning. And the one prayer that is daily prayer of mourning, you don't say on Tisha B'av? says the Talmud would know because it's a holiday. It's a holiday. It's a, fe- it's a festival. Therefore, you don't say Tisha B'av. This is a festival? A festival, the day that we mark all the terrible things that happen to our nation? And the answer is that, yes, God could have severed the relationship entirely. But in his kindness, he only weakened, he only diminished the closeness, but didn't get rid of it entirely. Is it a good thing that Moshe prayed to save our nation? Yes. But part and parcel of Moshe praying to have our nation saved is the fact that we're going to have things like Tisha B'Av and things like all the expulsions and probably the Holocaust as well, we could say. Again, we're not talking about the Holocaust, but we could probably theorize if we weren't allowed to theorize. If we were allowed to theorize. All that stems from Moshe praying. And the answer is, is that, that, that that's the world that we live in. We live in a world where God is going to be distant from us, but not going to get rid of us entirely. And therefore, there is a silver lining there. There is a fact that we are still here and we'll be here forever and God promises we'll never 
disappear from the face of the na- of the world will always be here but until we restore the closeness as a result of our own behavior where we say god we want to get close to you until we take that step well god is going to mirror what we do and therefore really what we're supposed to be thinking about on tishbab is ourselves ourselves as individuals as a community as a family as of course a nation and think about what are we doing to try to bring ourselves closer to God and therefore bring God closer to us and trying to kind of ramp up, to ladder up all those levels of distance that we've undergone throughout history and try to restore them, to go back, to revert back to the state of being a nation that's close to God until it's actually manifested in the temple. And I think in that in that light, it's these days are not days to think about the past, to think about the present and, and to think about the future. The past is what's going to give us the insight into our present condition. We no longer have a temple because we no longer have the relationship that warrants God to say, I'm going to dwell amongst you. And we believe that the Messiah come any day, and what does the Messiah do? He builds the temple. And it's still possible. Today is Tuesday, Tuesday night. We have a few more days left before Tisha B'av. It's possible that we've marked our last Tisha B'av. Uh, all the prophecies and all the prayers that we say about Messiah is that it could come any day, come suddenly. The change could happen in one fell swoop. Who knows if we're within striking distance? Again, that's something that only a prophet would know. Who knows if we're living in the throes of the birth pains of Messiah? We don't know that. If the temple is has been rebuilt by Tishabov, then it's going to be turned into a day of celebration because we will no longer have that distance. But in the unlikely event that we don't have a temple on Tishabov, let's take the time out on Tishabov to think about ways actions that we could do to try to restore the close relationship that we can potentially have with God and therefore take a step towards reversing the decline and putting another brick on the edifice that manifests the relationship between the Jewish people and God when they are close.